welcome to another day, another session of Doggington University that's brought to you by the Doggington Post and Merrick Pet Care. Well, this we are in. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're in for a great session. We're really proud that Merrick is sponsoring us because they are just one of the leaders in the dog food revolution. You know, when I go to dog shows, I talk to a lot of people, and when I talk to the folks at Merrick, I was blown away at the effort and care that they put in creating um, wet and dry dog foods that are uh, they're just wholesome. You know, when you open up a can of, of Merrick, it really smells good. They, they ask the question if your dog is, uh, dog's food is worthy of a fork, and the answer is yes. Uh, Merrick's recipes, they're, first of all, they're all made at USA. They're uh, USDA inspected deboned meat. It's the finest you can get. Um, when you feed your dog Merrick, you can see health in the bowl, and it's really important to your dog. You're invited to join Merrick's Real Food Revolution. Visit Merrick Pet Care on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Merrick Pet Care. So today we are here with the second of our sessions. And this one is going to be lively. This one's going to be really different. Welcome to all of you who are um, who are with us on the right-hand side. We love seeing the names of your babies. Continue to type them in, okay? Um, uh, type them in and the breed. We just love seeing that. Um, something exciting about each of the sessions that uh, Merrick is bringing us the, today. It's number two of eight online dog training seminars from the top trainers. They're going to share ideas, their hints, their secrets, and tricks to bring out the best in your dog. And today's really special because we're going to be talking about off-leash training, which we learned yesterday. This is the stuff that could save the life of your of your dog. Um, hopefully, we'll have some time for questions and answers, which was really exciting yesterday. Speaking of questions and answers, at the end of the webinar, one lucky wi winner, the person who answers a question correctly that will be based on our what our presenter shares today is going to get a 25-pound bag of what you see in front of you, grain-free, real Texas beef. That's a $60 value. And the folks at Merrick are doing something really awesome that they're also donating at the same time. They're donating in your honor <clears throat> to our friends at the National Mill Dog Rescue. So applause, um, a patting of the paws for our friends at Merrick Pet Care. And now on to our presenter. Nick is the owner of Off Leash Canine Training. He's based out of Virginia. He's got nine locations and growing. Um, he is a former U.S. Marine combat vet. He's also formerly with the U.S. Secret Service. He's worked with and taught some of the top names in dog training. Now, here's the controversy part. At Off Leash Canine Training, he specializes in electronic collar training to gain amazing obedience from your dog. Now, that's controversial. There are a lot of people who aren't fond of it. And Nick says there are a lot of misconceptions about e-collar training. He's going to talk about them. And he's going to show us the techniques that he uses to help create a strong bond between owner and dog. So Nick White, take it away. <laughs> hey everyone, thanks for uh, coming and to the webinar. I really appreciate it. I'm uh, happy to be here and happy to be invited by Doggington to help educate people. And um, So I'm going to get started about me. Um, as he mentioned, we specialize in e-collar training. We do personal protection and detection, uh, meaning your bomb dogs, drug dogs, bite dogs, and obviously basic and advanced obedience. Um, I have nine locations all throughout the United States. Um, my personal location is in Woodbridge, Virginia, Northern Virginia, about 25 minutes from DC. And at the end of the slide, I have a list of all of our locations throughout the US as well. Um, as you'll see, some about us, we get a lot of celebrities fly their dogs to us. We just recently did UFC world champion John Bones Jones, um, Roy Jones Jr three-time UFC champion Rich Franklin. Um, so we have a lot of people flying their dogs to us because of the results that we get. 
Um, we've been featured in a lot of magazines lately. Um, a lot of publications have done stories on our training. Um, as he mentioned, former U.S. Marine Corps Iraq War veteran and former U.S. Secret Service. That's kind of my background. Um, and now what we're going to do is we're going to talk to you um, about some of the misconceptions about e-collar training. I hear and I read and our clients, once they show up, hear all these crazy things that's out there on the Internet. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about is some of the things that you hear often about e-collar training and then actually the facts behind e-collar training. And then at the end, we're going to talk about confidence building. Um, that's one of my favorite topics to discuss. Um, I'm the official trainer for ABC's The Pet Show with Dr. Katie Nelson. And I always am talking about confidence building and why it's important. And in my opinion, it's one of the most important aspects of training, no matter what method you use. And I think it's a very underrated aspect by a lot of trainers. So we're going to talk about that and things that you can do and that we do with our police dogs and our protection dogs and even our regular dogs that you'll see some videos of. Um, throughout the course of the presentation. So we're going to get started about some popular myths about e-collar training. One we hear a lot is, I don't want to shock my dog. Um, you know, anytime we hear the word shock, it kind of drives me crazy. Um, and we're always very quick to correct people. Once people come into our facility, and we make every owner that comes into our facility try the e-collar on themselves, and pretty much 100% of people say, oh, wow, that's it, because everyone's expecting this huge jolt, you know, like they got struck by a lightning bolt, and it's really nothing like that at all. Um, to give you a gauge, uh, most owners don't even feel it until it's about a quarter of the way turned up, um, and most people, when we ask, like, well, what do you think it's like, they, they associate it with, like, stem pads. If you've done physical therapy, it's a small pulsating feeling that slowly increases, um, so it's not a shock like people expect. Um, and you're going to see some dogs throughout our presentation being trained with e-collar training, and you can see how the dogs react, and um, we'll talk about that. The, the problem is with e-collar training is when e-collars were first invented, um, they, had, they pretty much had three settings. They had medium, high, and then very high. Um, where nowadays, the modern e-collars, people realize that that didn't work because um, every breed, every dog, every size, the, the old e-collars were just way too much for your average dog. Uh, but now, the way the e-collars are developed, they're made for the smallest dogs. Um, as you'll see in a video soon, um, we just finished training an aggressive six-pound chihuahua with an e-collar. Um, and as you'll see, she's 100% different and more confident and happier and not aggressive anymore. Um, so that, that's where you get a lot of the misconceptions about e-collars. People remember the old e-collars that was, you know, medium, high, and then very high. There was like three settings. We're now, you know, like the e-collars we use go from a range of zero to 100. So there's a lot of very small increments um, throughout there. Um, the second thing, um, that we hear about, I hear this all the time, is I'm afraid it'll ruin my dog's confidence or it'll break my dog's spirit. Um, I kind of always laugh when people say that, whether on the phone or in person. Again, I'm a former military, um, former U.S. Secret Service. Most military and law enforcement, um, a lot of law enforcement nowadays are using the e-collar for their dogs. And as I say, military and police dogs are the most confident dogs in the world. So. Um, it's, that's why it always kind of amuses me um, when people say, oh, it's going to ruin my dog's confidence. Well, how do you explain police dogs being the most confident dogs in the world and they're trained on e-collar? So um, what we do is we use the e-collar to build confidence in dogs, as, as you'll see here in a second. The problem is, um, with all of this said about e-collar training, the most important thing is, is to find a professional trainer who specializes in using e-collars. Um, we'll get into that here in a little bit on a different slide, but before I move too far forward, uh, let me, you know, explain as with all this stuff said in the slideshow, that's assuming that you're not trying to use an e-collar, uh, which is my most feared word is when people try to use an e-collar. Um, so all of this is based off the assumption you have a professional trainer who actually knows how to use them properly. That's the key when it comes to e-collar training. Um, so back to ruining my dog's confidence. I hear that all the time. Um, so you're going to see kind of 
how an e-collar works with confidence here in a little bit. Um, but as I said, when it's properly done, we use it to drastically increase a dog's confidence. Um, if you look at our Google reviews page or our Facebook page, we always post screenshots of emails from owners who say, you know, the biggest change I notice other than obedience is the, the difference in her confidence level or his confidence level. So that's a huge misconception um, when an e-collar is properly trained with a dog. So I'm going to pause this for a second. Um, this is a five-month-old Doberman that we just finished named Doris. Um, the backstory on Doris is she was weaned from her litter like at four to five weeks, which as you all know or if you don't know is, is way too early. They should stay for eight to 12 weeks. Um, those... Those weeks between four to eight weeks teach the dogs a lot of things like bite inhibition, proper socialization with litter mates. So it has a lot of key things that's really important for a dog's foundation. Um, and she didn't get that because she was taken away too early, which wasn't that you know any fault of the owner. She was in a bad situation, so it was better to have her taken out than left where she was. Um, so Doris came to us with some problems. As you see, she has zero confidence. She's very, very skittish, uh, very fearful. Um, if some people would try to pet her, as you'll see in the before video, um, as soon as you try to reach out to pet her, she'll yelp like you know, like you did something painful, and she'll snap at you um, because she missed a lot of intricate, intricate things um, from those four to eight weeks that she should have gotten with her litter mates. So that's how she came to us. Um, so what I'm going to do is I have her before and after video here. So I'm going to show you how Doris was when she came to us. Again, she's a five-month-old Doberman. You'll see the issues she has, and then you'll see Doris after e-collar training. And we have over 400 before and after videos like this on our YouTube channel, which we give you the link to at the end. And you'll see that the e-collar doesn't ruin her confidence. And that's why it says in the text there, um, watch this video, which dog is more confident, more happy, and more stable, the dog prior to our training um, or the dog after our training. So I'm going to go ahead and start the video. Just watch Doris's mannerisms really close in the before video, and you'll notice a very substantial difference. Now here in a second, um, I'm getting ready to reach out to try to touch her to show you, um, show the people watching the video how she is when you try to touch her. As of right now, I haven't tried to touch her, um, so she feels a little bit more confident. However, you can see still how skittish she is. But watch right up here when I reach my left hand out to act like I'm going to pet her, how she reacts. Today, um, so a little bit closer on your progress in two weeks. 
so that's how Doris was the day we got her. Um, I pretty much literally couldn't touch her, as you saw. As soon as I tried to reach out to touch her, she would yelp and snap at me. Um, and now you're going to already see how Doris was the day before she went home. Uh, hold on, looks like the, the video stopped playing. Let me see if I can get it back up and running. Uh, for some reason, it looks like it's uh, freezing. All right, so why don't you just tell us about about it? Um, yeah, so um, let me. I'll, I'll work on that, and we'll try to get back to it um, here in a second. But everything that we've done, um, the video goes on. It shows her, you know, outside off leash, healing with distractions, you know, downing from 50, 60 yards away while dogs walk around her. Um, and we'll get it back up um, before the end, so you can actually kind of see how she is now. Um, but. All of that that we've accomplished is 100% through e-collar training, through positive reinforcement using the e-collar, through confidence building using the e-collar. And as you see in her before video versus a few seconds, unfortunately, of her after video, um, there's four minutes left of the video of her doing all the obedience and stuff, um, the, the clear difference between her confidence before versus her confidence after, and again, it was 100% accomplished through e-collar training. So, and like I said, we have over 400 before and after videos just like this to show that we use e-collar training as a confidence booster. So when people are afraid the e-collar is going to ruin the dog's confidence, it's actually the complete opposite, assuming that it's being used correctly by a trained professional. Um, and you'll see, um, like I said, we'll, we'll try to get this video back up and running um, so you can kind of see how she was with obedience after versus how she was before. But just in the clip that you've been able to watch, as you see, the clear night and day difference between how she was before and now after she's jumping and running and she's a completely more confident, happy dog and 100% was accomplished through e-collar training and confidence building and obedience. So um, we'll get that back to that, um, see if we can get it up and running and for now we'll move on to the next slide. Um, this is another thing that we hear a lot from people is, you know, well, why doesn't any vets or rescues recommend e-collar training or like people to use e-collar training? Um, that's not true at all either. Actually, um, some of our biggest supporters are vets and rescues, um, and most vets will tell you the same thing, that it's a good training device and tool when used properly. As I said, we're the official trainer for ABC's The Pet Show. Um, and Katie Nelson, who's the host, is one of the leading vets in the country and the, the former president of the Washington, D.C. Academic uh, Academy of Veterans Medicine. So she's one of the leading experts in the veterinarian field and we're the official trainer for her show because she's seen over and over the results that we get and the dogs we start with and the dogs we finish. So she's a huge supporter of the training method. As I said, vets will tell you the same thing that I tell you is find a trained professional to ensure it's used properly. That's the biggest, when it comes to e-collar training, that's 99% of it is a proper usage of it. Same, we're the official trainers of the Southeast German Shepherd Rescue, which is the largest German Shepherd Rescue on the East Coast because they've seen some of their low confident, aggressive, skittish um, dogs that we've taken in and trained for them and made remarkable turnarounds and confidence and obedience. Um, so they're a huge supporter of us as well. And there's uh, numerous, the animal shelter where we're at, um, we're the official trainer for them and numerous vet clinics throughout the DC, Virginia, Maryland area. Um, so a lot of, a lot of myths about e-collar training really don't have any factual basis. Um, it's just, it's kind of like anything on the internet. Someone hears it or reads it somewhere and then they just keep retelling the same story without actually researching it or um, finding out any information on their own. 
um, you know, we've had emails where people says, you know, well, you know, it's inhumane, it's abusive, you know, why doesn't the ASPCA or the Humane Society um, think e-collars are good or why are they against them? And actually, um, here's a pretty notable quote in the industry um, that was said, we recognize that older products were often unreliable and difficult to use humanely, but new technology employed by responsible manufacturers has led to products that can be used safely and effectively to preserve the safety and well-being of many dogs and strengthen the bond between their human companions. As I said earlier, the old e-collars, you know, 20 years ago were horrible. I would agree they were inhumane and um, there wasn't a lot of knowledge in using them back then, but as this quote says, now the newer ones are very effective when properly used. And the person that said that was Randall Lockwood, who's the vice president of the Humane Society of the United States. So actually the Humane Society does support the use of e-collars, um, the newer e-collars, considering that they're being used properly um, by a trained professional. Um, this is one we get a lot. Um, they've heard that e-collars will burn the dog's neck or, you know, the electricity will burn the dog's neck. Um, and again, we kind of always laugh about that when people bring that up. That's never actually happened in e-collar history. An e-collar has never been responsible for burning a dog's neck, the, the electric stimulation. Our dogs in the Secret Service sometimes wear those 8 to 12 hours a day, 6 days a week, and it's never happened. Um, the problem is, is a lot of people who, quote, try e-collars, which we'll go into that in a little bit, what they did is they didn't fit the e-collar properly. Generally, they left it on A, too long, you know, overnight when the dog's unsupervised, and they, and or they left it on way too loose. So what happens when you leave it too loose and on for a prolonged period of time is the dog's running around, playing, <clears throat> those prongs on the e-collar are constantly moving back and forth on his neck because it's been on, it's been put on way too loose. So what happens, those prongs um, rub their neck raw by constantly shifting back and forth because it wasn't um, put on tight enough or correctly fitted. And when you combine a loose fitting collar that's being shifted back and forth for 18 hours on the dog's neck and you're leaving it on longer than you should, what happens is it, it leaves really nasty red marks and it can even you know, leave gashes in their neck and people assume it's just from the stimulation of the e-collar, where that's never actually happened. 100% um, of times the dogs have um, markings on their neck or rubbed raw. It's from the owners uh, being uneducated in how to use it, and they left it on too loose, or they left it on too long, or we've even seen a combination of both. Um, so this is one of the biggest things that we stress to our owners on any e-collar training is we spend a lot of time talking to them about proper fitting of the e-collar. And as long as you fit an e-collar properly, your dog can wear it seven days a week for 10 years and never have one issue. Um, so that's really important. An e-collar will never, ever, ever burn, dogs in, uh, burn a hole in your dog's neck or the electric stimulation burn their neck. That's, that's just a huge myth that people who are really uneducated on the topic just assumed that that's what happened when really it was the prongs shaping back and forth for hours on end that r just rubbed their neck down raw. Uh, this is another one we hear a lot is everyone's afraid their dog's going to hate the e-collar. Um, they're going to associate it you know, with a punishment or they're going to run from it when they try to pull it out. Again, you will see this when dogs are improperly trained with an e-collar, when the owner uses the collar strictly for a corrective measure, which we'll get into that also a little bit later. But when a dog's properly trained, they won't hate it at all. Um, anytime I hear this, it's always from people who have never used the e-collar on their dog, or it's people who have never had it properly used. They tried to use it, and that's the results they got. But when, it, when it's properly used, um, as you'll see when I post screenshots on our Facebook page and on our Google reviews that people leave, is the dogs actually get really excited when they see the e-collar. So it's actually the complete opposite. Because what happens is when properly done, your dog associates the e-collar going on with going outside off leash. Um, so as of now, as you all know who have dogs, a lot of times when you take the, when you pull the leash out, your dog gets all excited and runs around in circles because they know you're going to go outside and take them for a walk. Now, look how excited they get when they know that you're putting them on a six-foot leash to be glued to you for the next 30 minutes. So imagine their excitement when they learn 
to associate the e-collar with going outside off leash, running around, chasing the ball, playing. Um, you doing obedience with them, which dogs love. It's a drill. It keeps them entertained. It's mental stimulation. So the dogs actually learn to associate the e-collar with going outside off leash and playing. So when a dog's properly trained, when you pull the e-collar out, they'll get all excited just as if you pulled their leash out, essentially. Um, hopefully this video will play all the way through. This is, uh, again, um, one to show you, you know, we hear all the time, my dog will hate the e-collar. This is um, NBA All-Star and NBA Rookie of the Year, John Wall's dog, Thunder. He's a nine-month-old pit bull. Um, you're going to see, I'm just going to show you a little bit of his before video. He pretty much didn't do anything um, like our standard before video. Um, but you're going to see how he responds with the e-collar after. Um, so, you, so again, I hear all the time, oh, my dog's going to hate the e-collar. Well, you can see in Thunder's after video um, how much he's hating the e-collar training. So um, I'll just show you a little bit of uh, his before. Um, pretty much right here, I'm trying to get him to come, trying to get him to sit. Um, so that was Thunder again before, and now I'm going to show you kind of what uh, Thunder looks like once we train him. I also forgot to mention they brought a muzzle with him because they said he's not that good with some people. Uh, they said a lot of people are afraid to touch him and pet him. He barks and growls at a lot of people for the over. Um, and they also said he's horrible at walking on a leash, which is something they really want to fix. So I'm going to go ahead and show you before. And again, as you saw with this come and sit, obviously his heel isn't good either if he doesn't come and sit inside. Um, so let's go ahead and I'm going to show you again Thunder after e-collar training so you can see how much he hates the e-collar as people assume in the training. So just really look out, um, watch his mannerisms um, when I release him and how he responds. Um, and again, you'll you'll see a very excited, happy, confident dog um, who's having a ton of fun doing this. Again, you see his enthusiasm going from object to object. Because when it's properly trained, it's fun for the dogs. They're jumping from object to object. They're running around. Um, as you see, once I release them, I play with them. So it's a very exciting, fun, engaging, mentally and phys physically stimulating uh, job for them to do. So as you see, you know, as he's bouncing around, and then watch his reaction when I release him. You'll see, you know, he's so motivated and excited and. And we'll just show you a couple more, and then we'll move on to the next slide. Um, but this is how a dog should look when they're properly trained with an e-collar. There's a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of excitement, tail wagging, running around.
So that's uh, that's just kind of what I want to show you. And again, um, we have literally over 400 before and after videos like this on our YouTube channel. Um, so you can see every dog is very consistently the same way. They're excited. They're running. Their tails are wagging. Um, so that's just kind of what I want to show people is when people think everyone assumes their dog will hate the e-collar. Um, they'll only hate it if they're not correctly trained with it. It all depends how it's used. It's like any any training device. It depends on the, the, how it's used, whether it's used properly or incorrectly. Okay, I'm just letting you know we got some people on fire in the questions box. Um, there are going to be sparks flying here. So, folks, if you have a question, go ahead and type it in. We will um, we will get to these questions. Okay. Um, I'm trying to use my uh, my cursor to go to the questions box, um, but it doesn't. Maybe it's because I'm in slideshow mode. Uh, well, we'll read the questions to you. Okay. Okay. Um, so do you want me to go ahead or wait for a question? Um, well, it, it, that depends on how you want to do it. If you want to stop and take some questions. Oh yeah, we can take a couple of questions. Okay. How can I build the confidence of my dog with an e-collar? My 15-month-old Texas healer looks just like Doris and has a story similar to hers. Well, again, uh, here, here's the thing about e-collar training. Um, I had Yahoo do a, a special on me and my business off leash canine about a year and a half ago now. Um, after that aired, you know, had like 38 million views, homepage of Yahoo. And I received a ton of emails and I received um, two things from major production companies who wanted me to create an e-collar training DVD. Um, they were going to fund it. All they wanted me to do was star in it, teach it, and put my name behind it, essentially. Um, both times, I turned it down, and I'll turn it down for the rest of my life. Um, the, the reason is, is it, it's impossible to say, no matter what dog you have, no matter what breed, what size, what age, no matter any of these factors, this is the way you train a dog with an e-collar. Um, and that's why I always tell people to seek a professional. Professional. And to be honest, I don't even care if it's one of our locations. It could be a competitor. I'd rather you use a competitor who knows what he's doing than try to do it yourself. Um, so it's really hard to, to talk to someone about how to use an e-collar build confidence without actually seeing that dog or interacting with it um, or seeing that dog's very specific issues. So that's why I refuse to do an e-collar training DVD, even though it would sell worldwide and I would make money without ever having to do anything is it would be very unfair to dogs and it would be very unfair to the owners, mostly the dogs. Um, and, I'm, and as I always say, I'm not willing to, you know, to put unnecessary stress or harm on dogs at the expense of making profit. So um, here at the end, we actually have confidence building drills that we can do. It's not with e-collar training, um, but it's stuff that we incorporate into our e-collar training at the end of the slideshow. So we're actually going to get into things you can start doing to build in confidence with your dogs at the end. Okay, uh, ready for your next question? Yep. Okay, controversy, here we go. I love um, it. <laughs> Rosemary writes, there is not one reputable credentialed trainer or animal behaviorist that endorses the use of shock collars. Well, other than the vice president of the Humane Society, um, and I always wonder what people consider a credible trainer. Is a credible trainer the guy that trains the bomb dogs and the protection dogs for the U.S. Secret Service, which are the top dogs in the world? Or is a credible trainer a person who went through an ABC behavioral college and did some online courses and got a certificate with a couple letters next to their name? So I guess it depends on what you consider a credible trainer. Okay. By the way, we're sending the link to the video of Doris out okay, in the great. chat yeah. so you guys could see that later. Thank you. Okay, copy that. Okay. Um, so Carla says, great questions coming in. Carla says, for those who cannot afford professional trainers that understand e-collars, are you saying that we shouldn't use them? What would be your advice to use? I would definitely say not to use them if you can't afford a professional trainer. Um, unfortunately, I, I, I am always the first to admit and the first to agree with the controversial people. I would probably say it's about more dogs are probably um, hurt with e-collars than benefited, and it's because people have no idea how to use them correctly. A lot of people assume it's a miracle device, 
where you put this $200 collar on your dog, you press some buttons, give some commands, and you wake up and you have a police dog at your house the next day. Um, it doesn't work like that whatsoever. It's a very systematic process. The training has to be customized to the specific dog and his issues. And um, So yeah, I would definitely recommend if you don't have any experience and you can't afford an e-collar trainer, to not try an e-collar on your own, which we'll get into that here in a couple slides as well. Uh, Patty says she has a, a Jack that was abused for the first two years of his life before she adopted him. He's now five years old, well treated, but still very skittish around everyone but me. Would e-collar training help him? Yeah, definitely. Um, and that's why I said we're the, we're the official trainers of the Southeast German Shepherd Rescue, which is the largest German Shepherd Rescue on the East Coast. And we train a lot of their dogs for free. Um, so we take dogs, just like Patty's dog, who, you know, whether it's aggressive, neglect, um, skittish, shy, um, every, every um, problem you can imagine, we work with them for free to rehabilitate them so they can go into really good homes. So uh, absolutely, we work with dogs with every problem you can imagine, and we do confidence building with them and obedience training with them and get them so they can take that skittish, shy, or aggressive dog and be in a normal, loving family, just like uh, Doris's video. You know, we, we deal with dogs like that all the time, and once they finish training can be you know, highly confident, highly productive dogs um, who are very open and love everyone, just as you saw in Doris's. And definitely uh, finish checking out the rest of her video because you'll see, just like um, John Wall's Pitbull, the excitement and the enthusiasm and the confidence that she has now versus how you saw her in the before video. Okay. Um, Stacy says, my dog loses his mind when he sees a, ca sees a car and nothing seems to snap him out of spinning and barking. Any suggestions? Yeah, again, what we do, and we'll, um, once we get into confidence building at the end of the slideshow, we actually um, do what we call noise desensitization. It's something that we do with military and police dogs, um, where all we do is we, we incorporate noise desensitization into the obedience, as you'll see here in a couple of videos. So what we do is, A, I would say, you know, get a good obedience program, find a, a good trainer so you get the obedience, as you see in our videos, where it's very reliable, instant. And then once the obedience is solid, you'll incorporate noises and cars into the obedience. Um, and we call that noise desensitization, which I'm going to get into a little bit later, which we work with dogs on pretty much on a daily basis. That's, that's how we get our military and our police dogs to the point where we can put them in a sit, a down, or send them on a bite, and we can shoot guns over their head, and it doesn't affect them whatsoever. We just um, get them desensitized to noises throughout their obedience training, so that way gunshots doesn't affect them. Okay. Um, Donna has one. Um, she has a well-behaved pit uh, who will run after or even on leash towards another animal. She's been attacked by small dogs in the past. I believe this is what triggered this. My question is, would using an e-collar help this behavior? She is Definitely. only on a leash with an easy trainer collar, and that has helped. But I'm 61. I have health issues. I love, I love her to death and do not w want her to get bit or accused of being aggressive. Can you help me? Thank you. Yeah, definitely. You um, again, like some of these videos I'm showing you, we literally, I think, on our YouTube channel have 300 and I think we're at 394 before and after videos of every breed, dog, size, age you can imagine. Um, and you'll see some of the dog aggressive dogs that we work with where the dogs are lunging and barking and pulling to get to other dogs. And then you'll see their after video where they're walking right past dogs in an off-leash heel. Um, so it's definitely something that can be fixed. Um, we deal with dogs with far worse issues than that on a daily basis. So it's definitely something that can be fixed. And when it comes to, to aggression with dogs, um, especially before I actually meet the dog, I always tell people, you may never get them to the point where they love other dogs, but you can have control over them. Like some of the dogs that we work with who have serious dog aggression, you're not able to completely fix the issue, but you can get them to where they won't react anymore. So they'll go from seeing the small dog and lunging and growling and trying to get to them to healing right past them without paying attention to them. Now some of them still may not be able to go up and play with the other dog, but at least they, they're in a controlled position and they're not reactive towards the other dog. Okay, Nick. Let's go back to your training. We will okay. come back to we will come back to questions, guys. Keep the questions coming in. 
Um, another thing that, you know, this is where a lot of misconceptions come in, is that e-collars are only used to punish the dog. Um, anyone who's gone through our training at Off-Leash Canine, um, any of our 1,000 plus clients a year at my location alone, um, will tell you that's completely uh, inaccurate, which is why you see our dogs respond to how they do in the videos. They're very excited, they're very enthusiastic, their tails are wagging. Um, when an e-collar is properly used, it should also the e-collar itself should also be used for positive reinforcement. Um, e-collars weren't originally designed just for a corrective or, or a punishment for a dog, so it should be used for positive reinforcement as well. Um, so the dog learns to associate the e-collar with positive, which again, that's why, as I said earlier in the slide, when you pull the e-collar out, your dog should be excited to see it because they associate it with something fun and positive, and not associate it with a correction or a punishment. Hopefully um, this video will make it through because this is a good one on many levels. Um, it's a six pound chihuahua. You heard it, not a Great Dane, not a pit bull, not a German Shepherd, but a six pound ch chihuahua that was brought to us for people aggression. Um, a lot of people are like, oh, my dog's sweet, she loves people, I've heard it all, um, calls her to be aggressive. Again, never happened in e-collar training history when properly used. Um, we fix and work with aggressive dogs on a daily basis, whether people aggression, food aggression, dog aggression, and we actually fix dogs who have these issues using e-collar training properly. Um, so this is a six pound chihuahua who was brought to us um, for people aggression, um, and you'll see how she is. And again, it's a, it's a good video because it's a very tiny dog um, who's the e-collar is being used on, and it's a dog who already has aggression towards people. So hopefully um, this one will play through a little bit. I'm not going to play it all. I'm just going to kind of play the before and some of her after so you can see the difference. And again, you know, people who think e-collars are horrible, watch this video and tell me which dog seems more stable, more confident, and more happy. The dog that you see in the before video or the dog that you see in the after video. And again, 100% of this was accomplished through e-collar training. Started a chihuahua for our two week morning train named Izzy. Uh, owner says she's a little bit aggressive towards men, um, so she can't really get around men that much. Um, so I'm going to try to show you what she does before. Um, I can already tell it's not going to go that well. So you notice her posture, her tail's tucked, um, obviously she's on edge, she's very uncomfortable. Um, so just notice how she is before and then kind of watch her body posture and body language and everything after. So we'll skip ahead. Uh, so this is Izzy now, um, once she finished our training. As you see, off-leash healing, um, just like the German Shepherds that and Malinois um, doing everything. Again, look at the tail, the excitement, the enthusiasm. As you can see, it's a completely different dog. Literally, um, it's a completely different dog. As you see her body language, she's much more stable, confident, she's happy, I'm petting her. Um, and again, 100% of this was accomplished through e-collar training. Um, so I'm just going to show you a couple of her things so you can just see the difference in how her body posture and language was before versus now. And again, that's another thing, you know, people always say, oh, well, I have a 
100 pound German Shepherd. I'm afraid the e collar is going to hurt my dog. Um, as you see, we use the same e collar on the six pound Chihuahua that we use on 100 pound German Shepherd. Again, as you see, completely different than her before videos. We do obedience, confidence building. We use the e collar for positive reinforcement. And that's why you get this drastic change that you're seeing from how Izzy was before versus how Izzy is now. Again, see the tail wagon, we're before, the tail's tucked, very defensive posture. Um, so that's all, um, you know, the video goes on to show Izzy doing, you know, a lot of other things. Um, but I just kind of wanted to show you a quick rundown on her before and after. Okay. Um, tell me whether you want more questions or you've got more to... Uh, I've got, yeah, I've we... got so many questions. Okay, um, I mean, is it okay if we run over a little bit, or? Um, sure, go ahead. Okay, yeah, that, that's fine. Um, yeah, take some questions then. Okay. Um, gosh, there's so many you guys ask the best, best <laughs> questions. Um, honestly, you, whatever, I'm looking for, for um, uh, we're, we're looking for all kinds of, um, of questions. Let's go. I saw some really good ones. Beth is like asking questions like, um, would it be a bad thing uh, to only use the e-collar as a correction? Can yeah, a definitely. Can teach their dogs commands with positive training and use the e-collar for correcting aggression? Yeah, I'm, I'm really, really big. Um, and this is where I differ from even a lot of e-collar trainers. Um, even people, you know, who are e-collar trainers, and that's all the training they do. Is I'm, I personally, in all of my locations, um, because I'm who trained them, um, I'm really big against using the e-collar solely for corrective um, punishment. Because what happens is, is just how I showed you a few slides ago. Is if you only use an e-collar for a correction, I can pretty much guarantee your dog isn't going to be excited to see it. As I always tell, I can tell if a dog's properly trained with an e-collar or not. Generally, if they're not, when you pull it out, they'll kind of like cower and back down. And if they are properly trained, then they'll be excited to see it. So only using it solely for a correction or a punishment, um, by doing that, you're teaching the dog that, hey, anytime this comes out, it's bad for you. Where we teach them the complete opposite is anytime this comes out, that's good for you, which is why we get that excitement and enthusiasm that you see. Okay. Next um, question. Um, you talked about people who were uh, qualified. Okay, I know that you have um, your business and whatever aside from 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 you. If they don't live in a location where you have a trainer, how do they determine who's qualified? That's a really good question um, and a really hard answer. Uh, and, and a couple I, of people, a couple of people saying, do you have, at least two people are saying, do you have an office in Florida? If not, can you recommend someone? Um, I do not have an office in Florida. Um, like I said, at the end of the slideshow, we have a, um, I put up a list of all of our locations. Um, we have nine right now, soon to be ten, so we're kind of slowly branching out. Um, but, yeah, for as, as far as what you're looking for in a trainer, um, I'm big on videos. Show me what you've done with other dogs in this situation. Right now, when someone says, hey, I have a German Shepherd who has this issue, can you fix it? I can say here's 15 videos of German Shepherds that we've worked with who's had that problem, and here's what we've done with them. And also, I'm really big on um, looking at like the person's Facebook page or the Google reviews. Um, Google reviews is really big because anyone can leave you a review. So if you see, you know, they have one and a half out of five star reviews on Google, then that means a lot of people weren't happy with them. So just do your research online and see what other people who's actually used the trainer are saying about them. Because um, to me, you know, from a military law enforcement training perspective, I personally um, don't get all wrapped up in are they certified with the ABC or because that that's that's a, a those are civilian schools that someone created a school and made money and now when you pass their course they give you a certificate with three letters at the end of it. Um, so like I said, who's better, the person who, you know, is a canine professional because they took a, a test with a hundred questions or the you know, Secret Service canine trainer who trains the top dogs in the world. So 
don't rely on, you know, the, they're a certified trainer or any of that. Just do your research online and see what other people who's used them have said about them. And if you can't find anything that other people said, that's probably a bad thing <laughs> um, because that means they haven't trained that many dogs or if they have, a lot of people weren't happy enough with them to, you know, express their happiness about it. So I'm big on looking at videos to see their work and then looking what other people have said about them and not really get wrapped up in who they're certified with and all of that. Okay, well, Rosemary is on the offensive here, and but she, she but what she says is she's she's a scientist, and she says any type of training that cannot be replicated, that cannot consistently work, is not based in science and is not likely to be a sound training technique. But e-collar training can be replicated. That's why I have nine locations. <laughs> So it is a sound technique. That's why I have nine locations and growing is it, it can be replicated. Okay. Um. And that's why the Secret Service use it and LAPD use it and NYPD use it and Las Vegas PD use it and the list goes on and on because it, it, it can be replicated and it is through numerous military and law enforcement agencies throughout the country. Okay, Jen says, I have two rescue dogs, both seven years old now. One has extreme fear, aggression, has no socialization as a young pup. The other has severe anxiety and also no socialization early. So if you use everything new as a uh, threat. We've been through numerous trainers and the issues have grown worse. Can yeah. e-collar training help them feel more confident and secure at this point? Yeah, and again, at the end of my slideshow, once we get past the myths about e-collar training, which is here shortly, um, the next topic I touch on is confidence building, which is where we kind of touch on that and some of the drills that you can start doing and drills we do with our dogs to, to help build that confidence up. So we'll get to that, Jen. Okay. Well, let's take it back to your popular myths. All right. Um, will my dog only listen when the e-collar is on? We hear that all the time. Um, that's not true either. Um, there's a process that we use to properly phase a dog off of an e-collar. Um, so again, once you find a, a trainer, um, ask them, all right, how do I start phasing them off the e-collar? And again, it's a proper way that you start phasing them off of it. Um, here, the thing I've been saying over and over and over is find a professional trainer. Um, as this says, it, it literally sends a chill down my spine when someone says, oh, well, I'm going to I'm gonna buy an e-collar and I'll try it and we'll see how it goes and then I'll get back to you. Um, as I said earlier, more dogs are probably ruined in the U.S. through improper usage by people trying versus benefited like that we do with dogs. For every one amazing tra e-collar trainer, there's probably 50 people who's trying to use one. Um, as this says, I always stress to people, when it comes to e-collar training, there is no trying. You're an expert and you will make a dog amazing or you have no idea what you're doing and you'll probably cause more problems. Um, and then people and their dogs generally find this out the hard way. So again, like as I always tell people, if you're not confident you're going to make your dog amazing with an e-collar, then I'm confident you're probably going to hurt them with an e-collar. Um, again, when it comes to e-collar training, that's the biggest thing. There's no trying. It's either you're an expert or you have no idea what you're doing. And that's why e-collar training has more controversy. As for example, marker and treat training. Um, notice I say marker and treat because the clicker in itself is a scam, but that's a whole other topic we can get to. Uh, marker and treat training where you mark the behavior with a word versus a $3 device that you've got to carry with you and it's inconvenient. Um, so you mark the, the behavior with the word. So you say sit, the dog sits, yes, give them the treat. Down, lay down, yes, give them the treat, versus a $3 clicker that someone convinced the world they need. Um, the, anyone can do marker and treat training. You can mess up marker and treat training. Your timing can be off. You can overfeed your dog. You can underfeed them. You can do it wrong for 15 years, and there won't be any side effect on the dog. With e-collar training, if you do it wrong for a short amount of time, there can be a lot of side effects on the dog. So that's why people, people don't realize it, but that's why really people are really against e-collars. There's people against e-collars because we use them in the Secret Service and we have the most amazing, confident dogs in the world. No. People's against them because all the people out there who have no idea how to use them, who use them incorrectly. Um, so that's the biggest thing I like to stress is all these myths and facts, um, find a professional trainer. I don't care if it's my competition, um, just 
go somewhere who knows what they're doing versus try to do it on yourself. Again, there's no trying. You're an expert or you're pressing buttons hoping to get a police dog um, tomorrow. So that's the biggest thing to take away when it comes to e-collar training. So again, just a, a summary of facts. When properly done, it builds confidence, as you see in the videos with Doris and the Chihuahua and the Pitbull. Um, amazing obedience, again, as you see in all of our videos, dogs who won't even come and sit, uh, off-leash healing and downing 50, 60 yards away on command with distractions. Can fix numerous behavioral issues, as you saw with Doris and the Chihuahua, whether it's aggression, lack of socialization, fear, anxiety, food aggression. Um, and it creates a close bond between the handler and the dog. Again, you know, everyone's always afraid, oh, is my dog going to hate me? No, your dog's going to love you. You're taking your two-year-old dog who's stuck on a six-foot leash his whole life to giving him freedom everywhere he goes, and you're bonding, and you're excited. As you see, if, if you watch through the videos I just posted today or our YouTube channel, you'll see I always am really excited interacting with the dogs. I say, break, they jump up. I'm like, come on, come on. I play with them. They come running over to me. So you got to make it fun and exciting. Again, use it in a positive way. And again, um, when properly done, you're mentally stimulating the dog. It's giving them obedience. You're giving them a job to do. And you're giving them the ability to be off leash everywhere they go. So it's physically stimulating as well. You're taking your dog who's stuck on a six-foot leash, and now you can take him to the park or the pool or the playground or the beach and just let him run around and wear himself out. Um, after this, we have a few slides on confidence building, which is going to answer a lot of people's questions. But if you want to take a couple more questions before we move on from e-collar training, um, this would be a good time. Um, we might not have time because we're at the end. Let's go to questions, and then we're going to have to, you know, we'll have to go to a wrap up. So let's go. Um, okay, uh, Donna says walking dog on a leash, obedient. Meeting another dog is horrible, wanting to snap and bark. But when the dog is off leash, the dog is fine. What should yeah, so that, you do? Yeah, so that, that's a case of, of leash aggression, which is actually a pretty common problem. So um, it's not like she has a, a completely unique situation with her dog. That's a pretty common problem is, is leash aggression. And again, my, my whole thing, um, you know, we get literally 150 calls and emails a week. Um, especially me because I'm the owner of Off Leash Canine Training as a whole. And one of the things I hear a lot, probably 10 times a week, is people will say, oh, you know, all of your Off Leash obedience, the Off Leash healing, all of that looks amazing, but my dog has aggression, and I, I just want to fix that. Um, you know, it looks, the obedience looks great, but I don't want to worry about that. I want to fix the aggression. And as I always tell people, they go hand in hand. Um, you have to have control over your dog when they get in those heightened states in order to fix their issue. I, I always say kind of a, a two, thing, um, two things when it comes to aggression and obedience. Is I've never seen a highly aggressive dog that was amazingly obedient, and I've never seen an amazingly obedient dog that was highly aggressive. Why? Because they go hand in hand. Um, you have to have control over a dog to work on its aggression. If your dog doesn't listen to you, you can't fix any of its issues. So once it gets in that heightened state, when it sees the other dog and it's barking, lunging, then that's when you need to be able to put it in a sit or a down. Let it calm down. Once it stays in the sit, pet it. As you know, the other dog approaches, if it jumps up, put it back in the sit, calm him down. And then once he you know, calms down, then you can release him. Um, so you have to get, the, the whole thing is, before you can fix any issue in a dog, is you have to have obedient control over the dog. You can't fix any issue in a dog that doesn't listen to you. It's, it's as plain and simple as that. Karen asks, where can an individual take this training to replicate um, this success? And you uh, know what? People, people are begging you to continue. They want uh, to know about confidence building. Okay, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm fine with that. If you guys we'll, have time... We'll, we'll, bow, we'll bow to our audience. Uh, great we'll to hear. Bow to our audience. <laughs> Good to hear, because I, I want to cover confidence building just as much as they want to hear it. So um, it's one of my so thank, most th talked about Thank you, Pam topics. and Pam and all of those who are, um, who are asking for more. We'll give you I, more. I appreciate Continue it. Thank ready? you, guys. I feel honored. Um, so the importance of confidence building... 
Um, it's one of my favorite subjects to talk about. It's one of my favorite things to do. It's my everything. Confidence building is my baby. So, um, again, anytime I do magazine interviews or I'm on ABC, I always talk about confidence, confidence, confidence. Confidence is just as important in dogs as it is people. Even most trainers in the U.S., they're like, oh, let's, we'll get your dog to sit, come. They never touch on confidence building, which to me is far more important than obedience, which you're going to see here in a little bit. Um, there's very, as I say here, there's very few highly successful people in the world that has very low confidence. It's the same exact thing as with dogs. There are no police dogs, military dogs, therapy dogs, French ring dogs. None of the top dogs in the world have low confidence. Why? Because we know we're gonna; those dogs are gonna become those in those positions, whether it's a police dog or a French ring dog. So at a very young age, we start doing confidence building drills with them. Again, this is something I say all the time um, to clients or in magazines: is if you gave me the option and you said you can, I'll give you a dog who has amazing confidence but he doesn't even know his name, or I'll give you a dog who knows 50 commands, but he has really low confidence, I'll take the dog with high confidence that doesn't know his name any day um, from a training perspective. That's how important it is. Um, so that's what we're going to kind of touch on is some of the things that we do and that you can do to start building up that confidence. And again, to me, confidence is the foundation of all training, whether it's just a regular pet dog who is just laying around the house and as a companion, or whether you're looking to get into specialized protection therapy, some other specialized um, sport with your dog. So again, what we were talking about earlier is um, one of the confidence building drills we do is noise desensitization. This is um, what I was touching on that we do with our military and police dogs, where we get them to where we can put them in a sit, a down, a heel, and literally someone five feet away can shoot a shotgun and the dogs don't flinch. From a very young age, we start doing noise desensitization. We expose them to as many noises as possible, vacuums, blenders, hair dryers, um, anything. And I, I know people out there, there's a lot of dogs, of so the people who's listening, it's a very common problem. They run from the vacuum or they hear fireworks and they run or they hear a loud bang and they run. Um, and this is stuff you can start doing today to help them overcome that. And not only does it help them overcome it, which is good, but it's a good confidence builder. So it makes the dog more confident. Um, so what we do essentially is the biggest thing that I always stress to our clients is from this lesson on, your dog isn't allowed to be afraid. Um, this is what we tell people who bring dogs to, to us with really low confidence. They run from vacuums, they run from loud noises, um, you know, if the screen door shuts and it slams, they run and hide on, under the bed or something. As we say, from this day on, your dog's not allowed to be afraid. So for an example, because um, this is a common one, if your dog run, is afraid of the vacuum, what we do is we put them on the leash. We do this at our facility all the time with dogs who have these issues. We'll put them on a six-foot leash, set them next to the vacuum, turn the vacuum on, and what the dog does is they try to run, but we're holding the leash. So we, And again, you got to have control over the dog. So we tell them to come, make them sit. We turn it off, we turn it on. They try to run, we make them come back and sit. Turn it on, turn it off. And we do that, and you'd be surprised. We take dogs who's ran from the vacuum every day for five years, and in 10 minutes, we're vacuuming them with the vacuum, and they're laying there. Because what dogs are creatures of habit. What happens is from some point at a young age, they heard this loud noise or a vacuum and they took off running. They don't know why they did it. They're a puppy, low confidence at that age, and it becomes a routine to them. I hear the vacuum, I run and hide. I hear the vacuum, I run and hide. It becomes a routine. So what we do is we break that routine. I hear the vacuum, I try to run, he pulls me back. Vacuum, run, pulls me back. Vacuum, run, pulls me back. Goes on, I don't run, good boy. We praise them, we play with them, break, and then we release them, and then we do it again. I can honestly probably say dogs who are like afraid of vacuums, the average time it takes us to break them of this is maybe 10 to 15 minutes. So it's such simple things that you can do that is a huge confidence builder for your dogs. So as I always say is don't let your dogs be afraid. Dogs are creatures of habit. If you let them run, they're always going to run from it. But if you make them deal with it, once they deal with it, they learn, okay, I'm here, it turned on, I'm not being hurt, I'm getting praised for, I'm getting played with, and they get over it very, very quickly. 
a, a funny story from about maybe six months ago. We had a client. Her dog was actually fine with the vacuum, but it was afraid of the toaster. So anytime they would make bread in the morning and the toaster would pop, it would take off running and hide under the kitchen table. So I'm like, well, when did this start? She said the answer I expected. I don't know. She's just always done it as a puppy. So again, she got in a routine. She don't even know why she does it. So I said, well, I don't have a toaster at my facility. Bring yours in. Put them on a leash, plugged in the toaster, down, I popped it up, she tried to run, I pulled her back. 10, 15 minutes, I put her in a down and was popping the toaster one inch from her nose and she just laid there completely relaxed and her owner said, you know what, ever since that we've never had an issue with it. Because what we do is we broke the cycle. Um, she learns, okay, this is stupid, why was I running from this, I'm being played with and pet, no big deal, and they very quickly move on. So that's what we do with noise desensitization is never let them run from it, bring them back and make them deal with it. We call that flooding. You flood them with the, the noise they're afraid of until they get over it, which is generally very, very quickly. So while they're exposed to that noise, make it positive, whether you give them treats or you pet them or play with them, and just don't let them run from it. That's the biggest thing with the noise desensitization is don't let the dogs be afraid. Bring them back and flood them with that noise until they don't care, which won't take you very long at all. And then what we do, um, as their confidence increases with the noise, is we increase the level of noise. So we may go from a light tap, get them used to that, louder tap, get them used to that, and slowly increase the noise. And that's how we get our dogs used to, to firearms, to, to shooting. As we start off banging on stuff, they learn to block that out. You know, we'll hit some pots and pans, they learn to block that out. We'll go 200 yards away, shoot a gun. They learn to block that out, come 100 yards in, come 50 yards in, come 25 yards in, and then till we're shooting a gun right over their head, and they've just completely blocked it out because they're so desensitized to it at that point. So if you're wondering, that's how we do it with police dogs to get them to a point uh, where they don't pay attention to gunfire is we just slowly increase the noise until you know we're right on top of them with a the gun shooting, and they've, they're so used to blocking it out that it's not an issue anymore. And I'm getting ready to show you a video here in a second so you can kind of see this into use. So this is a German Shepherd. Um, this is a German Shepherd who we were teaching, this was just last week, who we taught the watch command to. So the German Shepherd kind of is doing two things in this lesson. He learned the watch command and we incorporated noise desensitization into the obedience. So hopefully this one will play for you. Um, this is, I'm um, skipping ahead, this is one of our detection um, videos. So here's the German Shepherd doing the watch. So again, what we did is we got his watch really solid. Again, obedience is the you know paramount for everything. So we got the obedience really solid. Once the obedience was there, we slowly added in noises. Um, you see us in this video towards the end of the hour lesson, so the noises are pretty loud. But all we did is we started off as he's watched as light taps. As he learned to drown that out, louder taps, louder taps, and just slowly increased it. So this is a dog who is your average German Shepherd. As soon as they hear a noise, they turn. And this is the difference of an, in an hour. So you can kind of see how we incorporated the noise desensitization in. So again, and what, how we would do that is now that she's used to that, we would make louder noises and then louder noises and then louder and it would keep going until we could stand where we're at standing there and shoot a gun and she still wouldn't break the position. So that's kind of a video of how we use noise desensitization, incorporate it in obedience and it's a great confidence builder. Um, do, you, do you want to take a question on the noise desensitization before we move on to objects? Any questions on noise desensitization? Repeat, someone says, repeat thunder. What was that again? R thunder. thunder. Oh, like thunder. Yeah, like they're afraid of thunder. Correct? Yeah. Yeah, here, here's the other thing with noise desensitization. Um, a lot of 
Uh, I guess you could say a lot of our female clients uh, don't like when we tell them this, but it's there's a reason we tell them. Is what what a lot of people do when they get a puppy is that dog hears that noise for the first time. Say it's thunder. You have this 10-week-old puppy. It hears that loud crack outside. What's it to do? It comes and runs to mom, right? Or dad. But we'll just we'll say uh, mom for the scenario. So it comes running to mom. What does mom do? You pick up your cute little fluffy puppy, and you're like, oh, it's okay, baby. It's okay. It was just a little thunder, and you're loving on it and snuggling it and picking it up. So what I say on a daily basis when I talk about noise desensitization is you're comforting the dog, correct? It was afraid. It's cute. You pick it up. You comfort it. Comfort is just another word for praise. That's my catchphrase that everyone loves. Is comfort is just another word for praise. What do you do when you're comforting your dog? Oh, it's okay, it's okay. You're patting them, you're you know rubbing them, you're picking them up. What do you do when you praise your dog? Oh, good boy, good boy. Same voice. You're picking them up, you're rubbing them, you're playing with them. So what you're doing is you're praising your dog for being afraid. So now again, dogs are creatures of habit. A month later, your cute fluffy puppy. Run, here's that loud crack, it runs to you, you play with it, you comfort it, you praise it, and it just gets in a routine. Now, five years later, your cute 100-pound German Shepherd, here's that loud crack outside, it's in that routine. I hear this, I run to mom, she plays with me and praises me for being afraid. So essentially what you're doing is you're praising your dog for being afraid. You say comfort, I say praise, they're the same thing. You're praising them for being afraid. So in addition to the noise desensitization, as I said, is any time, say your dog is afraid, and it's not something you can replicate. Obviously, you can't replicate the noise of thunder. Um, if they come running to you, just don't pay attention to them. Don't look at them. Don't acknowledge them. What they learn is if you don't make a big deal out of it, I don't make a big deal out of it. But if you make a big deal out of it, they're going to make a big deal out of it. Imagine if every time your kid was afraid, he came running to you, and you gave him ice cream. He would live his life in fear, <laughs> which is what dogs do. Um, that when this process happens. But even though you can't replicate thunder, if you start doing these noise desensitization drills now with different noises and stuff, you'll notice a huge difference when the thunder does come because your dogs learn to block out the noises and um, to, to not pretty much pay attention to, to those loud noises outside because they've learned in doing this training to block those out. Okay. Um, would noise desensitization help? Uh, Beth wants to know. Help her dog who barks at even the smallest noises. Forget Cassie says, what about the doorbell? Yeah, de well, this is kind of a two-part um, answer. So I'll address the first one first. Is yeah, definitely noise desensitization will help with that because again, your dog is so what what's happening is your dog is so sensitive to noises. As soon as it hears a noise, it's going off because it's very sensitive. So when you do this training, you teach them to block out all that stuff and focus on you, whether through a watch, a sit, a place, a down, um, a wide variety of commands you can use to teach them to focus on you. And what we do, which you didn't see in the video, um, is say I have a dog in a down and I start making noises and it spooks them and they jump up. We just go, nope, down, put them right back in the down and we repeat the noise, but just not as loud. And if that one doesn't get them, make them jump up. We praise them and release them and play with them. Then we put them in the down. We do the same noise a little bit louder. If they jump up, nope, we put them right back in the down, repeat the noise. Once they don't jump up, good boy, and we praise them. And all we do is we keep building up that noise. So it starts as sometimes a light tapping and increases to a 12-gauge shotgun being shot 10 feet from them um, for military purposes. So that's how we do it. And that's why, again, I said obedience is important is your dog has to be able to be controlled. If your dog has the option to run every time, then he's just going to run upstairs every time he hears the noise, and there's no way you can work him through it. So, um, The second part with the doorbell, again, coming from a, a military police perspective, as I like when the dog barks during the doorbell. Uh, a joke me and my trainers at my facility have that we kind of always laugh about is I, I have people who says, hey, Nick, I got this German Shepherd. I want to do your personal protection stuff with him. Um, but also when we do that, every time someone knocks or rings the doorbell, he runs to the door and goes crazy. Can we fix that? And I always laugh. I say, so you want a personal protection dog who's going to protect you and your family, but not a dog that barks when someone kicks open your front door. So, um, so what, I, what I'm a big fan of, to kind of answer your question, um, is when they ring the doorbell and the dogs bark and start going crazy, is I'll praise them. Good boy, because that's what I want out of my dog, who's a Belgian Malinois, who's a police dog, 
is I want if hey if someone gets close to that door you let me know so I praise him but through obedience I teach him to control it so it's not excessive if the doorbell rings or um, you know someone knocks on the door he goes flying to the door going crazy 100 miles an hour and I go good boy but then when I've had enough and I'm like all right I know someone's there off and he stops immediately and walks away so again I'm a huge fan of letting the dogs bark when the doorbell rings or someone knocks but controlling it so it's not excessive so okay uh, do you want me to move uh, on to the objects sure um, so the next thing we do, object desensitization. I'm huge on. I just did a um, article recently for Nova Dog Magazine um, where I talk about confidence building and I talk about object desensitization. Starting your dog now, you know, whether it's a five-year-old or an eight-week-old, start getting them on as many objects as possible. Chairs, park benches, tree stumps, Tupperware containers, slippery surfaces, grainy surfaces. It's a huge confidence builder because you're exposing them to numerous heights, elevations, textures. We get dogs every day who are deathly afraid to get on the place cots. We teach the place command with. They'll jump and fight and run around it. And these are like two-year-old German Shepherds. Why? Because growing up they weren't exposed to anything other than the floor, other than grass and asphalt. So now they're two years old and we try to get them on something new and they're like, no way I'm not getting on that. So starting now, get them on as many objects as humanly possible. Again, just like the noises, if they're afraid of it, make them get on it, use the leash, pull them on top of it, even if they're fighting, pull them on top of it. Once they get on it, praise them, good boy, good girl, good girl, make a big deal out of it, then release them, and then put them right back on it. You'll see in a very short time um, that they'll be going on it without any issues. And it's such a simple thing you can do now to prevent any issues in the future. And even if you don't need to use place for obedience. Again, it's just a great confidence builder. It's one more thing that makes your dog feel really confident. Even if you don't use it for any practical purpose, it's a good confidence builder. Um, so I'm going to show you a video of um, that. Any dog that is that won't jump, like you're having to lift your dog in the car, 100% confidence. Uh, assuming they don't have like hip displays or a medical issue, but that right there, what you're seeing is 100% lack of confidence. And this is after. And again, watch his enthusiasm and excitement. So all that, what you saw before and after, was accomplished, accomplished through object desensitization. What we did is I would pick Lou up, set him on that, good boy, praise him, play with him, pull him off. And I make them jump off. That's the key. So it gets them used to getting off on their own. You don't want to do all the work for them. I'll help them up, play with them, make them jump off. Help them up, play with them, make them jump off. And if you repeat that for 10 to 15 minutes, boom, he jumps up like he's done it his whole life. Um, every day we deal with people with German Shepherds who the German Shepherd won't jump in the back of their SUV. And they're like, oh, I don't think he can do it. He'll put his front paws up just like you saw Lou do. Within 10 minutes we have him doing it on command. Um, we just make him, pull him off, make him, pull him off, make him, pull him off. And as we're making him, we play with them once they're up there. So they learn to associate the object with something positive. So if you have a dog who you know won't jump in the back of your car, it's 100% object desensitization. And that's all you have to do is make them do it, make it a positive, make them do it, make it positive, and make them jump off and repeat, and you'll be surprised how quick they'll adapt to that. Same, just like noises, never let them be afraid. As I always say, dogs aren't allowed to be afraid. If you see he's afraid of something, make him do it, wait for him to relax, then pull him off. When he's up there relaxing, play with him, praise him, and repeat over and over and over. 10, 15 minutes, he'll be jumping up on it like he's done it his whole life. Do you, uh, you want to take a question for that, or you want me to move on? We have like two more slides, and then we're done. 
Okay, so move on and then we'll come back to questions. Okay. A huge misconception I hear all the time is playing tug with your dog. Every week I hear people, I say, oh, you got a German Shepherd, you should start playing tug with him. They're like, oh, I've always heard that um, that'll make him aggressive. Not true at all. Never happened in the history of dogs. Um, playing tug with your dog is actually one of the my top three confidence builders to do. Um, and contraire, here's a big myth, so everyone listen up. Um, this is going to blow some people's socks off, is let your dog win. Your dog should never, ever, 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 ever lose a game of tug. Not once. My dog is a four-year-old Belgian Malinois who does over 30 commands. He's bite trained. He's drug trained. Has never lost one game of tug in his entire life, and that's why he's one of the most confident dogs you can find. It's a great confidence builder. I hear somewhere, someone, probably 50 years ago, well, not that long as we didn't have internet, tw probably 20 years ago, wrote on some article, if you you should always beat your dog to show them you're the alpha. That's the worst advice I've ever heard in my life. Well, one of the top few. Um, your dog your dog should always win. It's a great confidence builder. And Matt, how high is your confidence if every time you came over to my house to play pool, I beat you? Then my mom played you and she beat you. Then my grandma played you and she beat you. You would have horrible confidence in playing pool and you wouldn't want to play anymore. Same things happen with the dogs. If they why would what's their motivation to play a game they always lose at. There is none. Um, so when you play tug with your dogs, let them win. As they get better, make it more of a little fight. You know, again, we incorporate noise desensitization in this with our police dogs. Once they're good at playing tug and they're jerking and they're putting up a good fight, we'll make noises in the background, slowly increase the noises, and that's how we get them used to biting on a sleeve um, or biting a person without the shot, you know, the the, the the firearms going off in the background affecting them because they're used to it in training. I bite, I play tug, I hear gunshots, I hear people banging, it doesn't affect me. Play tug with your dogs, let them win. Um, whoever said you should always um, beat your dog to show them you're the alpha, well, uh, they were wrong. I have a thing that isn't as nice to say, but we'll just say they were wrong, so don't ever believe that. It'll never cause aggression, and you should always 100% of the time let the dogs win. Also, how we get our dogs really tug motivated is we always let them win. Who doesn't like to play something they always win at? Everyone. If I always won at pool, I would be a pool player. So um, if I always won at baseball, I'd be a baseball player. So that's the first one. The second one is only give them limited access to the tug. We only let our dogs play tug maybe five minutes a day. We'll run them through some commands, sit, down, place, touch, heel, break, and then we'll play tug with them. We play, we play, we let them win. We take it back, do some obedience, play, let them win, take it back, and they don't get it anymore. Um, as I always say, I've never seen a dog that's really motivated to play tug who has 24-7 access to a tug, meaning you leave it laying on the floor at your house. Limited access is what makes them motivated. I only get it limitedly, and I only get it when I do something good, and it's always fun. Just The analogy I use is if you fed your dogs bacon, Three, three meals a day, seven days a week, in a short amount of time, it wouldn't be a treat. It would just be food. That, it's only a treat because they only get it limitedly and only when they do something good. And again, make the tug fun, engaging, and exciting. You know, good boy, you know, kind of play with them. Make it really fun. And don't overtrain them. One of the drills we do every day with our protection dogs is we always leave them wanting more. Once I'm getting ready to put up the tug, um, I'll have you know the owner have the dog on the other end of the leash. I'll tease the dog with the tug after we've played with them. I've played some games. I'll tease them. You know, I'll put it in front of them, make them miss, put them in front of them, make them miss, run back and forth. And once they get really, really riled up because they're so motivated to get to the tug, I just turn around and put it up. So they all it always leaves them wanting more. We always do that drill. At the very end of our tug sessions, we'll tease them. Once they're really worked up, we'll just turn around and put the tug up. So it ends them always wanting to play more. And the next day when you pull that tug out, they're like, there it is, and they go crazy for it. And again, as I said earlier, you can incorporate the noise desensitization into the, the, the game of tug. And then I think this is the last one here. Socialization. Every... I'd say 90% of our dogs that we work with that have dog aggression or people aggression are related to socialization. Lack of socialization is puppies. I'd say 90% of the dogs, this is their problem if they have people aggression or, or dog aggression. 
Start socializing your dogs. As soon as you get a puppy, socialize, socialize, socialize as much as humanly possible. What we do with our aggressive dogs that we work with, in addition to the obedience and e-collar training, is what I call positive association with people. So this will answer, I think, Jen's question maybe from earlier. Is every person you meet, um, use a high-valued reward, like hot dogs. Like we use a lot of times like turkey hot dogs just because they're a little bit healthier. But a hot dog is considered a high-value reward to a dog. I meet very few dogs who aren't completely crazy for hot dogs. Um, so every person your dog meets, start having them get down like on their level and just slowly extend their hand and feed them hot dogs. Like if you watch the beginning of Doris's video, that's what I was doing. I had hot dogs in my hand, and that's how I was getting her to approach me. So that what that does, it teaches these aggressive dogs or under-socialized dogs, every person I meet has something really awesome for me. So that's why we call it positive association with people, is it teaches the dogs to associate something with, uh, it teaches them to associate people with something positive. Every time I meet a new person, it's good for me. Um, the analogy I use, I'm huge on using people analogies, so make it easy for people to understand, is if you, imagine you're not a people person, you're very shy and reserved, all of a sudden, one day, every person you run into gives you a $100 bill. After this goes on for a week, you'll probably start to be pretty excited to bump into people on the street. Um, so it's the same with dogs. They learn every person I meet, they have something really awesome for me, and it teaches them, and it helps rehabilitate them to learn to so it learn for them to learn to associate uh, people with something positive from now on. Um, here's the thing that we deal with that people always find funny, but it's very common. Is socialize your dogs with as many different people as possible, different ages, different races. We have dogs every week who they're great with adults, but they're aggressive towards kids. Or they're great with, you know, African American people, but they're aggressive towards, you know, Caucasian people. Or, or the roles are reversed. And I always ask, um, well, when you got her as a puppy, was you know, was she around a bunch of kids? And they're like, no, where we lived, it was uh, like older, no one really had kids. So that's why. They weren't socialized with kids. A lot of people assume when I socialize a dog, I socialize them with people and dogs, and that's all they think about. But it needs to be a wide variety, kids, adults, African Americans, Caucasians, a wide variety of people. Because we see dogs every, I'd say not every week, but at least every couple weeks, who is aggressive um, just towards one race. If I walk in, they're completely fine. They love me. They lick me. If one of my African-American trainers walk in, they'll start growling and going crazy. And that's what it is, is when they were growing up, they lived in a neighborhood or an area that was just Caucasian people or just African-American people. So they weren't associated with that type of person. And now all of a sudden they're like, what the heck is this? And they elicit that response. So that's something that a lot of people don't think about, but keep that in mind. Same with dogs. Every, and I think someone even shared earlier um, on here. We deal with people with dogs every day who are great with big dogs and are aggressive towards small dogs. So they're great with small dogs and they're aggressive towards big dogs. Th same thing as the people. Generally, it's because they were only socialized with big dogs as puppies or they are only socialized with small dogs as puppies. So when you're socializing your dog, you want to ensure you're varying the size and the diversity of breeds of dogs as well. So you uh, eliminate that from happening. And the last thing that you know I always love talking about because it's controversial even though I really don't know why, but um, as I'm huge against dog parks. Um, dog parks, in my opinion, is a horrible place to socialize your dog. As, as I say, um, every day in America, or a, a, every dog park in America, seven days a week a dog gets bit. Every dog park in America, seven days a week a dog gets bit there. Do at dog parks, it's a pack mentality. There's 30 dogs running around, no one's in charge, dogs are pack animals, someone's got to take charge. So in order to show this pack of dogs that I'm in charge is I got to bite this guy, I got to dominate this guy, I got to hump this guy, and it always starts a fight. Um, I can't read the, the messages of people's writing questions, but I, I can guarantee you there's someone in this forum right now who their dog got bit at a dog park. That's how confident I am. So I always recommend socializing your dogs in small groups, you know, one-on-one, one-on-two, -on -one, one -on um, I'm just huge against dog parks. There's no supervision. Even doggy daycares are better because there's supervision. There's people out there with the dogs who can kind of break up fights before they start. In a dog park, not the case. It's 30 dogs running around. No one's in charge. So an alpha male confident dog has to take charge. And the only way they can do that is by biting or dominating. Um, so it's a really bad idea. And your dog can 
take away a lot of bad experiences from going to a dog park, um, and which is the opposite of what you're trying to accomplish. You're trying to socialize your dog so he doesn't become aggressive. He got bit there, so now he associates dogs with inflicting harm upon him, so now he is dog aggressive. So, and we see that every day. Um, so I'm a big uh, against dog parks for socialization. Um, here's our information. Um, there's our website, our YouTube channel. Again, we have 400 before and after videos, our Facebook page, which is great. We have almost 16,000 followers. Our fans are awesome. We post screenshots of their emails and pictures every day from, and videos that owners send us of um, after they went through our training. So I would definitely check that out. And then um, there we are on Twitter. And here's to answer at, at earlier. Um, oops, let me go through this again. Um, I have the locations pulled up here. Um, here's all of our locations um, throughout the U.S. as of now. And like I said, we're expanding, you know, so we're growing and continuing to grow. So definitely check back. Um, but here's our current locations. And uh, if you have time, if you know, if you want to open up for some questions, I'm definitely open. We're, to... we're at the hour and a half, so we're going to have to um, bring this to to an end. Our folks have been passionate, but it's been an hour and a half, so we're going to have to go back to wrap things up. It's time to give away a bag of Merrick. All right. Here's a question. This is based on something Nick said. The first person to type it in, type in the answer. So get your typing, get your typing fingers ready. Okay. Go over to the box, put the cursor in the box, get ready to type, because here we go. Aggression goes hand in hand with what? Aggression goes hand in hand with, and what's the answer, Nick? Obedience. And Amy Fisher is our winner. Thanks for paying Thank attention. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> Amy, you paid attention. Aggression goes hand in hand with confidence. Amy, if you will, con uh, you will contact us at info at uh, doggingtonpost.com with your details. We will pass that along to our good friends at Merrick Pet Care, and they will um, get you your voucher. Um, we will be back um, with the Merrick Pet Care Doggington University program. Um, we will be back. Uh, Brooke, when are we back next? Is it tomorrow? When's, when's, our, tomorrow, when's our next session? Tomorrow at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Tomorrow at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. So um, not only did Amy win today, but National Mill Dog Rescue won today due to Merrick's generosity. So guys, join the Real Food Revolution, facebook.com forward slash Merrick Pet Care. We want to thank Merrick Pet Care for making this possible, and we want to thank all of you for coming and for your great, great questions. Thanks, everybody. Sharon says, great session. Thanks. People are typing. Uh, thank you, Nick. Um, absolutely awesome. Thank we'll you. See you my all. pleasure. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everybody. The organizer has ended the session and this call will be disconnected.